Hello, and welcome to Encounters with Polish Literature, brought to you by the Polish Cultural Institute, New York. I'm David Goldfarb, and I'll be your host. Hey, space looks different. Well, not like this space where I record, but we've got new opening titles designed and animated by my fellow producer, Natalia Iudin. And you'll see some other updates to the graphics throughout the show, as well as new closing credits. The opening and closing audio comes from a work of Musik Konkret, which is music composed from recorded sounds by Radek Przedpilski, a Polish composer and digital artist based in Dublin. The work is called Księga Blasku, The Book of Splendor, inspired by the work of Bruno Schulz. And you can hear the full piece on soundcloud.com under his handle, Buhaj, that's B-U-H-A-J-J. You will also notice that we have fully incorporated Ukrainian literature into our title, which was originally a hasty addition back in March of 2022 to show our support for Ukraine in response to the Russian invasion. Unfortunately, the war has not ended, and we have additional special episodes on Ukrainian topics on the agenda through the middle of 2024. Of course, it's not unfortunate that we're talking about Ukrainian literature, but um, it is unfortunate that the war is ongoing. Our topic for today is a Polish Yiddish modernist poet, aesthetic philosopher, essayist, and prose writer, Deborah Vogel, whom we mentioned in our episode on Bruno Schulz because she was close to Schulz, and the stories in Schulz's cinnamon shops are believed to have come from letters that he wrote to Vogel. Vogel is a writer who wrote in both Polish and Yiddish, was born in Austro-Hungarian Galicia, and lived in Lviv when it was the Polish city of Lvov, and was active in Polish and Yiddish literary circles. Her work raises a question that I hope to continue addressing in future episodes of Encounters about how we account for multilingualism and multiple identities in Polish literature. Are Yiddish language writers from Poland who wrote about Poland and were Polish citizens not also part of Polish literature? Before we meet today's guests, who are arguably the two leading scholars of Vogel's work, I'd like to thank everyone who has been following and supporting Encounters with Polish Literature. So please remember to subscribe, click the bell for notifications, give us a thumbs up, and watch the credits at the end to see how you can help our friends in Ukraine, as well as seeing the new animation and hearing the new music. So stay tuned. Anastasia Lyubas is editor and translator of Blooming Spaces, the Collected Poetry, Prose, Critical Writing, and Letters of Deborah Vogel, published by Academic Studies Press in 2020, which received the MLA Aldo and Jean Scaglione Prize Honorable Mention for the Translation of a Literary Work in 2021. She's also co-editor of Walking with Vogel, New Perspectives on Deborah Vogel Through Poetry, Visual Art, Translation, and Scholarship, a special issue for In Gewebe, a journal of Yiddish studies, co-edited with Catherine Hellerstein and Anna Elena Torres, October of 2021. Karolina Szymaniak is an assistant professor at the Tauba Department of Jewish Studies at the University of Wrocław and a research fellow at the Jewish Historical Institute and is a leading representative of the young generation of Yiddish scholars in Poland. Her research interests include Polish-Jewish literary relations, the history of Yiddish modernism and the avant-garde, women's literature, and translation studies. She is co-editor-in-chief of East European Jewish Affairs and author of the first monograph on Yiddish-Polish writer Deborah Fogel. She has edited and co-edited seven volumes, including Warsaw Yiddish Avant-Garde and My Wild Goat, Anthology of Yiddish Women Poets, and others. She received the 2016 Ed Politica History Prize for her, her edition of Rachel Auerbach's Writing from the Warsaw Ghetto. Currently, she is working on Auerbach's intellectual biography. Karolina and Anastasia, thank you for joining me on Encounters with Polish Literature to discuss the work of Deborah Vogel. Thanks for having me, David. It's a pleasure, Karolina. It's a pleasure for me and lovely to be with both of you here. Fantastic. So why don't we start, you know, I know, Anastasia, you said you're working on um, a biography of Deborah Vogel. First of all, um, Deborah, this is how she's referred to. She refers to herself, in, you know, in her in her text. It's in some places it's uh, um, her name is, you know, appears in, in Yiddish. Is, is Deborah like what we should go with or or is it uh, uh, Devoira or um, or uh, 
Do you have views on this? I'm really glad that you're bringing up the name uh, right off the bat. Um, so it's definitely Deborah Fogel, as she's known in English and as she she wanted to be known. Um, in Yiddish, we refer to her at times as Deborah Fogel. Um, she was an important Yiddish author, as well as a writer who was writing in Poland, an important writer in Polish, um, born in 1900 in Bursztyn, in Galicia. Uh, that was uh, then Poland, now currently Western Ukraine. Lived a very short life, perished in 1942 in Lviv um, during one of the Nazi Aktionen. Um, and uh, she is, first of all, uh, to be known as an important writer, essayist, intellectual and poet. Uh, she did propose her own intellectual program uh, that was to reconcile aesthetics as we know it as a philosophical project and uh, literary aesthetics. Uh, she was a conversant uh, to important Polish literary figures, Stanisław Ignacy Witkiewicz, uh, Bruno Schulz, as well as on in the Yiddish letters with uh, writers such as Rachel Auerbach, Rochel Oyerbach, um, and others, um, a well-known ambassador of Yiddish modernism um, in Galicia. Galicia. Um, and when I say ambassador of Yiddish modernism, I mean the Yiddish modernism kind that was um, mostly widespread in North America, in New York specifically, connected to groups uh, like Inzich, um, translated in itself, uh, with um, Arn Glantzleilis at its helm, as well as some Yiddish circles that I hope we'll, we'll dive a little bit uh, into around Zustayer, uh Literary Journal and um, publishing house in Lviv that connected Yiddish writers uh, in Galicia in, in trying uh, to forge a compelling Yiddish literary culture. Uh, so in my, in my biography, I'm trying to uncover multiple threads um, of Fogel's life um, and intellectual work and position her um, as an important contributor to intellectual conversations. Um, for example, conversations on the questions of form and content, conversations about uh, the meaning of artistic reality versus uh, the reality and content of life. So you mentioned that she uh, she uh, knew Vitkevich. I know that there are, uh, I think I've seen uh, two portraits of uh, Deborah Vogel um, uh, by Vitkatze, uh, who was the subject of uh, one of our earlier episodes. Uh, how did she come to know Vitkatze? Uh, he was you know, a major figure in his era in Polish literature. Well, she met Vitkatze in Zakopane, but she knew Vitkatze as an intellectual, as a philosopher, an artist before. Um, as a student, she devoted one of her uh, student papers, student essays, uh, to Vitkatze's theory of the pure form. And it was quite early, I mean, a year after Vitkatze actually published this theory. And she continued to engage with him intellectually. And as many intellectuals at, in, that in the interwar period, she she was spending her summers also, not only, in Zakopane, which is southern Poland in the mountains, where Witkatze and Bruno Schulz uh, would also come. I mean, also her uh, friend, whom uh, Anastasia mentioned, uh, Yiddishist intellectual uh, Rochel Oyerbach and many others. We actually have lists of people who came uh, to Zakopane, so he, we can pin it uh, uh, really up in on the timeline. Um, so it's uh, in the late 1920s, probably 1928, when she comes to uh, uh, Zakopane and starts her uh, a conversation, I mean, another dimension of her conversation with Vitkatze. Uh, she hands him in her uh, PhD, uh, dissertation that was devoted to the epistemological dimension of Hegel's aesthetics. 
uh, with an addition of the philosophy of uh, Josef Kramer, but this was an addition, <laughs> actually, that was not her own. Her professor wanted her to write also about the Polish, uh, a Polish philosopher. So, so that's how uh, this uh, thesis was constructed. But this was really uh, her. Uh, one of the most important frameworks for her thinking, the, uh, I mean, the Hegelian aesthetics. And here starts a friendship, uh, a conversation, a discussion. They really meet in a very important point in their thinking about what actually the forum is. That's what Anastasia mentioned, that she's trying and she's one of the really intellectuals of the in the interval period who got with Katze very well. And in 1931, she wrote uh, she wrote an essay about Witkatz and his theory of the pure uh, form. And we see in this very essay uh, uh, why they really, uh, um, I mean, why Witkatz became so important for her. Because his theory of form, uh, uh, which is not the, I mean, uh, that's when we have to have, actually, I think, Anastasia come to um, to discuss what Fogel thinks, what form is, and how she differentiates between what is a you know like the form, the, the life form, and the construction, and the, the life context, and the, the 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 this is one thing. So the 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 content that comes from life, which is not actually the the real content for her, of of the work of art. And this is uh, something else. There is this uh, essential, as she calls it, uh, uh, content uh, that is closer to the construction of the uh, uh, of the uh, of the work of art. And here she finds in Vitkatze, I mean, another uh, uh, um, another philosopher who tries to think about the form differently. The the problem with with uh, Fogel and I think uh, I mean I mean uh, the challenge and the what is fascinating about her thinking is that she's trying to move away from uh, from what how we speak about things because we are used to saying okay that's form that's content and she's try, trying to say no like it's the language that is limiting us and it's limiting our thinking so we we need to really uh, reform, changed radically the language itself. And that's what she sees in Witkatze, I think. We know that uh, Witkatze's uh, novel, Narcotics, um, the conversations with Vogel made their way into this novel. And this is uh, where if it's we a really... novel. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's that's exactly it's the question. A, kind of uh, a collection of essays, maybe. We, we talked about it a bit in our uh, in our Witkatze episode. In this piece, um, you know, there is the, there is a conversation happening on the insatiability of a form, and and you know, mm-hmm. a, again, the way that the content of life see, seeps into the art uh, in, into the artistic reality. Can we maybe like see how this works itself out in 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 one of her earlier works? In her uh, her, we have basically three literary collections, right? We have uh, Togfiguren, which is a day figures. We have Manikinen, which is mannequins, um, a uh, an important Schultzian theme. Uh, and I think a lot of people who know about Vogel know about Vogel through uh, Schultz. And we have uh, her uh, her final collection, Acacias Bien or Acacio Kvitno, the uh, Acacias Blooming. Which she wrote in both Polish and Eng- and uh, Polish and Yiddish, um, and uh, let's let's maybe uh, you know I, I'm I'm also thinking not only about her uh, uh, about her um, her engagement with these questions of form, but where this all you know the idea of Yiddish you know her idea of you know Yiddish modernism uh, sits with you know with the uh, the Yiddish literary community. I'm wondering if we can look at. Um, uh, one of those poems from uh, from day figures, uh, Tog Figuren, um, the milkman, which I think uh, um, kind of you know, it's interesting to look at at the background of well, you know, Yiddish literature's most famous milkman, uh, who is a very different kind of milkman than uh, than the milkman in uh, in uh, in Fogel's poem. Um, maybe uh, would one of you like to read uh, read it in Yiddish? Certainly. Der Milchmann, dreißig Tag hota hoidisch, dreißig mo, groe gas, lange gas, schmole gas. Tag zenen amol, zis wie weiße Milch, flach zenen wie stille Milchflecken. 
oder zerrieben in treuere Tropfen die Milch gerinnen. Das Leben ist eine papierene, milchige Flüssigkeit in der grauen Blechkanne von einem Tag, in sieben Kannen, in dreißig Kannen, und ein Ballen von weißen Bälken per Kahl, was schmeckt klebig mit süßer Milch und mit der Wasserigkeit von Teig und Verbräuchte. Man kann von jenem Perkal schneiden, sieben Teilen, dreißig Teilen, und der Stoff bleibt damit sich gleich, milchflach, milchsess und steiftreuerig, wie ein Ponem, was klebt sich zu, zum siebten Mal, zu einem weißen Rem von einem Tier, zu einem bräunen Rem von einem Tier, ein dritter Tier, ein dritter Gas, ein vierter. And would you like to read your translation? The milkman. A month has 30 days. 30 times. Gray Street. Long Street. Narrow Street. Days are sometimes sweet like white milk. Flat like quiet milk stains. Or crushed into sad drops like curdled milk. Life is a paper. Milky fluid. In the gray tin can of a day. In seven cans in 30 cans, and rolls of cheap white calico with a sticky odor of sweet milk and watery days unused. From this calico, you can cut seven pieces, 30 pieces, and the material always remains the same, milk flat, milk sweet, and set stiff, like a face which is glued for the seventh time to a white frame of a door, to a brown frame of a door a third door, a third street, a fourth. It's kind of a bleak picture, isn't it? I mean, it's kind of, it's very much the uh, the proletarian milkman, right? I mean, who, who has to, uh, you know, who is dealing with a kind of drudgery from day to day going, you know, counting the, you know, where the milk becomes a calendar. Uh, you know, the emphasis on calendric time, you know, kind of struck me at the beginning, since that's such an important theme in, in Bruno Schultz that must have come out through um, the discussions between uh, Vogel and Schultz that went into Schultz's first stories. Um, not that I want to, you know, uh, sort of think of Vogel as completely subordinate to Schultz, uh, but I just happen to work on Schultz, so uh, so I can't avoid uh, avoid having that in my head. Um, uh, but also, just you know, thinking about you know, um, you know, I, I mean, you know, the most famous uh, you know uh, Yiddish author, you know, at this time would have been you know Shol Malechem, uh, known for his stories of Tevye the Dairyman, this great humanistic figure with, you know, a sense of humor and, uh, you know, both wise and foolish at the same time and uh, complex in his human qualities, where here it's, it's you know, the milkman is really reduced to, uh, to, uh, to this monotonous life. Yes, the picture painted, indeed, um, is very different from what you might imagine as a representation of the figure of the milkman, um, as you mentioned, as a, both a proletarian figure and also this figure that's um, in some ways very overdetermined by, you know, the, the Yiddish uh, literary representation. Um, and yet this is um, exactly the program of avant-garde that Fogel presents, where she takes things out of their context and rearranges them in a very different composite unity um, where, you know, relationships are really disentangled. Um, and you did mention this calendric time, this circular time, which is very important. And it's emphasized through repetition, through repetition throughout the different verses of, of the poem. And we also have, you know, so we have this circular uh, image and we also have an image that's uh, more like a frame, that's more uh, rectangular in nature. Um, and this uh, also relates to, you know, the aesthetic programs that I think she she's commenting on here. Um, so if you think, for example, on uh, the most uh, conventional um, philosophical programs of aesthetics, um, it's easier to imagine them in a circle where uh, 
different forms of life are being encompassed into um, sort of the discourse in a circular way. So there is the discourse and there's uh, something, you know, outside of the discourse. If you think of, to comment on, on Hegelian aesthetics, uh, you know, his aesthetics would very much be um, an aesthetics that um, a circle could serve a good image for, where it's the evolution of the spirit, uh, which um, uh, subsumes various artistic forms into perfection. Um, while I think, you know, Fogel's project is a bit different here. Um, I did mention the image of a rectangle, the image of the frame, which is much more about really showing the limit between the thing and the human, um, which is, you know, the way that she presents the milkman. There's is is there a milkman in this poem? This is this is the question. Is there is there a milkman in the lines that say something like, "Life is a paper milky fluid, and the great tin can of a day." Um, again, a very uh, sort of rectangular uh, image, uh, if you will. Um, I think she's when she's playing with the frame, she's really playing with it with the limits of presentation and representation and modifying and constantly shifting and constantly shifting. It's not moving towards a perfection. It's really working on that limit. And every once in a while, it seems to bump up against, you know, against reality, uh, you know, in the world. Like whenever she says sticky, there are a lot of sticky things in uh, in Fogel. Um, and, you know, so the, the sticky odor of the sweet milk that struck me as like um, this is something that's, um, you know, it, it's not reducible to form, perhaps. I mean, I, I don't know. What do you, what do you what's your take on that? That's the meta of life that she's actually struggling or trying uh, to uh, to represent through the constructivist or cubist constructivist form. And when Anastasia was talking, like this is a rectangular image, and then we can think about, I mean, very easily about Picasso or Brack. I mean, that's what she's trying to do with the re literary representation uh, is, and that's what she uh, uh, herself says, is a, an answer to what is happening in the visual arts. And I think also in the Milkman, and there is a whole series. These are different street figures. We also see her uh, take on thinking how to represent the Jewish space and the Jewish uh, culture. And that's one of her answers to it. I mean, that's her first uh, um, her poetry book. And then she gets, gets more and more engaged with different also Jewish uh, topics. I mean, many critics said, oh, she's so un-Jewish. She's not writing about uh, enough about, you know, the Jewish life. And here, what she wants to say, I mean, she's treating those figures as, you know, like exemplary figures that can help her understand the nature of life. And that's what she's, I mean, that's her philosophy. That's what, that's why, I mean, when Anastasia asked this perfect question, is there a milkman in this poem? I mean, that's that's what she does. I mean, she looks at this sticky reality and there's always this drop of stickiness in her. You're right about that, David. And that is melancholic, actually, very melancholic. I think. Because next to the rectangle, we have ellipsis, which is a symbol of melancholy. And I think this, this is really a thread that goes through her, uh, her writings. Uh, but this is what she's trying to do. She's trying to get, you know, to the essence of the experience of life and understand it through, you know, the, uh, what she would call uh, through the essential contact that is construction here. Why does she, you know, ultimately decide to write in Yiddish for a Yiddish speaking audience? I mean, she says in her famous letter to Bruno Schultz that, uh, you know, she kind of sometimes wonders what she's doing because people who are interested in modernism can't understand Yiddish and people who, are, who understand Yiddish aren't interested in, you know, in avant-gardism in this way um, that, uh, of course, Shol Malechem, you know, has 100,000 people at his funeral in uh, in New York and uh, and Dvorah Fogel were, were kind of uh, reviving in, in you know, in, 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 uh, in 
recent time. Um, and she's aware of this. She's aware that, you know, she, you know, but 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 yet she's insistent and she, you know, on on writing, writing in Yiddish. Why? Why is she writing in, in you know, in Yiddish for a Yiddish audience? It's, it wasn't really her. It wasn't Mamaloshin for her. It wasn't her, her native language, really. I mean, she's not the only one. Uh, that in the period <laughs> that decides to write in Yiddish. Uh, true, Yiddish was uh, not her first language or second language even. She comes from a acculturated uh, family and a Zionist family. So she speaks Polish and she's also taught Hebrew and uh, she also wrote in Hebrew actually and some of her essays exist uh, in Hebrew and it's fascinating to see how she also changes so she's writing in Polish about uh, in Yiddish I'm sorry about uh, white words and they become gray words in, in the Hebrew uh, version so her poetics of uh, uh, self-translation is also uh, fascinating um, so yeah so Yiddish is not obvious um, there is a story to it uh, um, told by her friend uh, her university friend uh, uh, Rachela Rochel uh, Ruchl, actually, we should say in Galicia, uh, Oyerbach. Uh, she um, mm, she came from a Podolian shtetl, so her background is completely different. And she, Yiddish was her mama, Loshin, and but she was perfectly bilingual, as many uh, Galician Jewish intellectuals of the time. And she tried to convince as many intellectuals. Uh, to actually convert to Yiddish. And we also see it in her letter to Schultz where she uh, tells him, okay, if you cannot write you know, uh, in Yiddish and belong to the Jewish world, just belong to the world, not to the narrow Polish uh, cultural uh, context. And so she, she tried it with different, uh, with different authors. Um, and well, she says, oh, I convinced my friend uh, Dosha, that's, uh, that's how she calls her, uh, to write in Yiddish and to engage in in this you know new uh, endeavor of you know establishing a modernist uh, uh, Yiddish center uh, in uh, Galicia. Uh, so that's her answer, and she says, "Okay, this was really I actually you know sentenced her to this life of being you know in between languages, not being fully understood by the Yiddishist milieu, and being you know uh, estranged from the Polish milieu." Uh, but that's her also, I mean, she had a Yiddishist agenda. That's her story. Um, so why Fogel chose Yiddish? There can be many answers and different people engaging with Fogel have their own different uh, answers. I think it was exciting at that time in Lviv. Also, uh, let's think where we are uh, in terms of, you know, historical and social context. That's Lviv after the war and after the Lviv pogrom. That's also the time when many intellectuals decided actually to write in Yiddish to convert back to the Mama Loshin. That's that that's what her other poet, Yiddish poet friend does, Rochel Korn, uh, who also comes from Galicia. And she she actually started writing in Polish. She wrote a story about the a pogrom. And then she really uh moves to Yiddish and uh, and gets engaged with the Yiddish uh, literature that she did not know so well. She knew, you know, Rilke and Leshmian uh, very well, but not uh, the Yiddish literary history that she's actually learn learning. So, uh, and that's, uh, I mean, Fogel also enters this world and she tries to position herself as a Galician Yiddish writer. She writes actually his history of Yiddish literature uh, in Galicia. Um, so that's one context. And, and for sure, for Fogel, it was important to be a Jewish uh, writer and recognized as a Jewish writer, but on her own terms. So when we, we read her first things that she wrote in Polish, these are very typical, not very boring, maybe, but I mean, uh, less, much less exciting than what we have in Yiddish and Polish later on. Um, prose uh, pieces in in the that we could position within the framework of Zionist youth discourses, Hashomer Hatzair, so the the the, the scout. Uh, a Zionist uh, a movement. She's a member of this uh, movement. I mean, her uncles are important Zionist activists uh, at that time. And well, to be a Jewish writer in Polish, you have to express the difference through actually through the, you know, through the subject. You have to deal with Jewish subjects. And that's not enough for her. She, she wants to do something totally different. 
in her own uh, writing. And Yiddish offers this freedom, Yiddish, this international language. She can be, you know, read everywhere. Uh, and that's that's really something that had, I mean, there is this, uh, 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 this aspect here and we can read about it in her letters and she can be free. And that's what connects her to the to the uh, to the modernist Yiddish group that Anastasia mentioned in Zich. That's what they say. We are Jewish writers because we write in Yiddish, and we can you know deal with Buddhism or any other topic that is important for us in Yiddish. And by you know by the by the fact of writing in Yiddish, we are Jewish writers, and that's enough. That's pure. of course in Zich. Uh, then there is a dim- dynamic to the development of the group, but that's 1920s. Uh, and I think that's one of the answers, but I don't think that's the only answer that we could give to to this question, why Yiddish? What Carolina is unpacking is really uh, different agendas of, of a linguistic choice. And she did mention that, you know, Rochel Oyerbach had her own agenda. And the question that we could pose is, should we take um, Oyerbach's account at face value, that still remains the question. That's, you know, a speculation that's uh, seen from uh, Rochel's uh, point of view. Um, interestingly enough, Deborah herself did not leave an account of why she chose to write uh, in Yiddish. Uh, in her correspondence to her uncle, Marcus Aaron Price, whom Carolina mentioned, who was an important early Zionist activism, um, later the Philo of Stockholm, the chief rabbi of Stockholm, and previously, uh, you know, rabbi in different other locales throughout Europe. Um, So he was somebody to whom Fogel writes about a different linguistic choice. She was looking for a German publisher for this early collection uh, that she was writing, day figures, uh, potentially, um, because she thought that there might be a market for this avant-garde um, expression in, in that language, potentially. And um, her choice of the correspondent, her choice of wanting to bring this up with her um, uncle is uh, really compelling because he was somebody who knew a dozen languages and, um, you know, obtained very rare mastery in Swedish. He was recognized as really masterful stylist in in, uh, Swedish language, in addition to all the other languages, including Hebrew. His project was about trying to make uh, Judaism, you know, reconcile Judaism with the world of Christendom in Europe and really renew that relationship while her project could also be seen as making Yiddish, you know, this language of the European avant-garde or, you know, the world uh, avant-garde, as as Carolina mentioned, international avant-garde. And we know that there's some interesting experimentation that's happening in Yiddish in America at that time. And, you know, she connects into um, that group uh, in Zeich in, in trying to think about what it means to write it in Yiddish, uh, even though the question still remains, for whom does one write in Yiddish, to uh, repeat it once again. It's both uh, cosmopolitan and uh, and inward looking, you know, in a, in a sense, right? That it's uh, it's paradoxical in that way. That it, it has its own in group, but it's uh, but on the other hand, it's like you write in Yiddish. You're immediately connected to New York. You're immediately connected to these other world capitals. And if you we're thinking about other Polish writers who are somehow discussing, were in conversation with uh, Yiddish writers, so we see that for them. I mean, it was somehow amazing that, you know, they were publishing in New York and there are Polish writers, very well-known Polish writers who write to Yiddish writers, like such as Josef Patoszczuk, a very important prose writer of the uh, um, of the really? 20th century. Well, you, the international writer. So there was this allure of uh, being, you know, international through the medium of language. And we were earlier discussing also the fact that, you know, Fogel wanted to transform radically the language, you know, the 
really the matter of her own art. And when she's entering Yiddish, of course, she knows German and Yiddish is a highly Slavicized Germanic language. Um, and we feel this, you know, Galician uh, German uh, influence in her own uh, Yiddish, but she's entering a new linguistic word and she doesn't have those, you know, limits uh, that a person, a native speaker has. She can construct a new linguistic reality here. She's somehow free to do that uh, as well. So perhaps there is also this aspect. And once Anastasia mentioned that she never really uh, discussed her linguistic choices, but she is really until the end of her life, most of her works are published uh, in Yiddish, except for the uh, collection of, I mean, Katia Kvitno, that is also published in Polish. There is no major book work uh, that she published uh, in Polish. She published a lot of essays and uh, and uh, other texts, in, in press texts, criti literary criticism, art criticism. Um, so this is fascinating. But when she's you know talking, and that's what An Anastasia mentioned, talking to different people, talk, discussing with her uncle, she's revealing one part of her linguistic self, discussing with Schultz. She says, oh, I'm actually... Uh, you know, not doing enough to be present enough in the Polish, uh, uh, you know, on the Polish literary scene. And then when she's writing to uh, Aaron glanz so a, a Yiddish modernist poet, a member um, and co-founder of the Inzich group that me, we mentioned earlier, she says, well, actually, I, you know, I don't want, I mean, I want to be a Yiddish writer. You know, Polish is just like a context. So, you know, she's also like modeling somehow her own, uh, uh, you know, like image as a, as a writer uh, when she's uh, talking to different audiences, to her different, I mean, and for her really, uh, those, uh, you know, uh, letters that she's writing and being in a con in conversation with different intellectuals, it it's how she's really establishing her, I mean, uh, developing her thinking. So the, these are important documents of her intellectual life. Carolina, you mentioned one of your fam you know, favorite works of uh, Fogel is this uh, this poem Caracones, uh, Cockroaches. Uh, would you like to to maybe read it in Yiddish and, and we can talk about it and, and we'll, you know, and Anastasia can read the translation? Of course, the theme of cockroaches. I mean, it's like a very Schultzian theme and we'll see how different it is. And the title of Vitkatz's first uh, juvenile play, yes? Yeah, so we're back into this. Polish modernist, uh, rad radical modernist context. Karakones. Wie von schwarz lackierten Papier sennen sie, also flach, schwarz papierene Ellipsen. Papier will sein flach, verwachsen mit der bretterener Flachkeit von der Tisch. Wie das Ponem von Aleben emerit, was will mehr gar nicht. Nur sein a wasserig Blatt Papier. Zugeklebt zu farbige Kulissen. Karakones willen flach sein, wie bierbräune Bretter, wie Papier, gar nicht mehr wellen. Das Brett soll wellen. Beautiful. Would you like to read the translation, Anastasia? Cockroaches, as if made from black lacquer paper, so flat, black paper ellipsis. Paper wants to be flat, overgrown with the flatness of boards of a table, like a face of a person retired from life who wants nothing anymore, only to be a watery sheet of paper glued to a colorful backdrop. Cockroaches want to be flat, like beer brown boards, like paper, not wanting anything the board should want tell me why this appeals to you so much i mean i you know it, it's a great it's a great reading that you did uh, both of you um uh, and it's uh, and it's wonderful to hear your um your uh, you know literary yiddish accent uh, carolina um that uh you know, that's not not something that's you know that's uh, that one has access to typically. Um, but I'm uh, it's actually in, in Galician Yiddish, but I I, I read it in the literary uh, standard. Uh, there there yeah. was this temptation. <laughs> so I mean, to me, it's 
one of the darkest of her poems um um and uh, the the one that really reveals this as she herself says the other side of the things so this deep depression and melancholy and uh, and I simply keep thinking, I cannot stop thinking about this last sentence, Gornisht uh, Mervelen, dos bret, so velen, and about this resignation that is a very important theme uh, in her own writing and thinking, and uh, about um, really also this desperation that is not only present in, in her writings. I mean, people think you see cockroaches. And of course, everybody who sees cockroaches as they do with the mannequins, they think, okay, that's Schultz. And she's stealing from Schultz. And I think like these are, David, I might ask you as a Schultz uh, scholar, they're very different cockroaches uh, than the Schultzian ones. And these, you know, this, again, geometric look uh, and of course, these are elliptic uh, at cork crouches. And this, 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 you know, like striving not to want. And there's so much wanting in her writing and philosophy. So I think here we can find a lot of threads. And, but this is one of the simply personally, and I translated it. Uh, as a very young person, I was really struggling. I was sometimes, I think, I don't know, I don't think I knew. I was too young for her at a given moment. Uh, but this is the one that simply somehow touches me uh, personally, but also helps us inscribe Fogel into the you know European discourses of melancholy. And I think she's, when we want to position her, uh, so we can position her in different intellectual contexts, as Anastasia mentioned, and I think that her book will also uh, uh, show it. Uh, and but she is a part of a larger uh, in European conversation about melancholy, and that poem simply embodies her uh, as a melancholic uh, writer for me. That's very insightful. I, I think that. Um, maybe that comes through in the way that, you know, she represents, you know, kind of space as layers of flattened objects, you know, kind of we imagine like a Matisse cutout or something like that, um, where, where, you know, I mean, that's, it's like collage, right? I mean, that, uh, that, you know, in the world of memory, uh, we have, uh, maybe not a three-dimensional picture, but these two-dimensional, uh, uh, layers you know on on top of each other and that you know and then maybe melancholy is that is that sense of memory that sense of uh you know is con connected to that that sense of you know memory entails loss reduction to uh to two dimensions yeah what she sees in the abstract art she hated this i mean she hated she didn't like the title she thought the name uh she thought that this is misleading uh um, it is a it's, it's concrete art in a way and that's what we see also like those you know like all these unnecessary details and what is left is this watery uh piece of paper um so yeah i think i mean but the fascinating thing with Fogel is that really she's able, if we read her poems and we agree to the terms of her own language, uh, that we can very clearly see that these poems have a very important philosophical meaning. And that's what happens here. You could ignore this, cockroaches, okay, not so interesting. But if you really agree to what she's inviting you to, this is, uh, you know, leading you somewhere else. One thing that's, you know, as a, as a Schultzian is, you know, kind of figuring out, you know, which way do things go? Like, like one of the, one of the, in, you know, kind of themes that's kind of big in, in Schultz that, that appears here is uh, in, in her, uh, in her second collection in, in Manikin and uh, in the section called uh, Schundballaden. Um, and I'm wondering, Schund is, you know, is kind of lowbrow, uh, you know, trash, right? Um, and I'm wondering, is Schunt in Yiddish the same thing as uh, you know what we call Tandetta in Polish, or is it uh, is it related but not not exactly the same? Uh, what 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 does that mean? Schunt became, I mean, a term in the Yiddish literary history. It's like pulp fiction, uh, and the fear of Schunt actually 
uh, is an important thread of, uh, you know, like 19th century, late 19th century uh, discussions and Shalom Aleichem, whom we earlier mentioned, so a Yiddish uh, modern, not modernist, but modern for, for sure, classic, uh, uh, was one that really uh, started war on Schund to establish the position of Yiddish literature as a uh, as a uh, you know important intellectual uh, phenomenon. Um, but Schund, I mean, uh, here with Fogel, I think Schund is close to Tandetta. That's how I actually. Uh, translated into Polish. Anastasia, you had something. I'm really glad that Karolina brought up, brought the Yiddish uh, literary commentary on on Schund and popular culture, as well as obviously the understanding of Tandetta in uh, Polish literature and obviously uh, Schultz. I think um, you know Sh- uh, Fogel uh, really brings together this constellation of understanding of what popular or pulp. Uh, fiction and, and art is uh, from the visual avant-garde uh, tradition, as well as, you know, the Yiddish uh, literary classics uh, who were male, um, put were trying to put a firewall between uh, the popular, this is the popular culture, this is your pot boiler novels, um, and we are going to create really highbrow literary expression in Yiddish and, you know, there is an anxiety, a fear, a fear of shund in that way, while her literary program really reworks or works shund in into this um, avant-garde expression. Would you mind reading the the poem uh, Ballad About a Trashy Novel? Uh, maybe we'll just read this in translation to uh, to save time since this one's a little longer. A ballad about a trashy novel. And so it came about, as they write in pod boilers, with invented ludicrous fates. He remained forever the best memory of her life, yet he was always her life's greatest misfortune. Couldn't live with him, couldn't live without him. Why did you break my heart? And the heart is forever broken as they write in cheap novels. And life is squandered, long as melancholy, as they describe in these stories. What does the word squandered mean? Yet everyone understands it. In every street and house, delicate ladies, stiff gentlemen, carry shards of broken hearts cut out from trashy novels. And sweet ladies cut out from wood and stiff wooden gentlemen imitate a shoddy novel. Its title, Life, Happiness, and Death. And here she's quoting all kinds of cliches about uh, uh, about uh, popular popular novels intentionally. Intentionally, uh, you know, f- you know, it's about the language, right? She's just playing with this, you know, this this language of uh, of uh, trashy novels, uh, you know, schlechten Romanen, right? I mean, bad novels, uh, which you've translated in different ways, in you know, in in each. Um, each uh, each instance. Uh, if I could ask you, since we do have a, a certain following among translators on this program, uh, what what was behind that that decision? Since I noticed that sometimes, like certain words, you're very consistent about in translating, like you know, you know, sticky and things like that. And then here, you know, I mean, I, different languages, you know, do this in different ways. But I, you know, my sense is that in Polish, like there's a much stronger prohibition against repeating a word than in English. So that if you repeat something, I've written about this in, you know, in, in Schultz and his, you know, references to uh, the word paube, which is a very difficult word to translate, um, that uh, so translators try to avoid it. Uh, and, uh, and, and here, you, you know, some, you know, you translated, you know, Schlechten uh, as, uh, as uh, Schlechten Romanen as, you know, pot boilers, um, cheap novels. Um, we have, uh, uh, trashy novel, shoddy novel. Um, and you know, is it, you know, what, is it marked that it's, uh, you know, does it make it more marked that she's repeating herself or is it, uh, is it less marked? What, what went behind that decision? Fogel's vocabulary is known to be very sparse. You did mention that there is certain 
Fogel-esque words uh, that could be uh, seen as the hallmark of her style, repeating of the word sticky. We're talking about Manekinen. Um, so this is her second um, poetic um, poetic uh, book, which is which I find uh, is a bit different than the first one, where it's really about the sparsity of geometric figures and um, the sparseness of vocabulary that goes along with it. Um, in this particular in this particular poem, I think despite the title that it is a ballad about a trashy novel, I think it's a really great example of not just the literary, but also the visual, uh, the choreographic, um, and, you know, the musical. Um, it, it's just um, as if she was taking all of these different angles. Um, and I think, you know, her philosophy about repetition and repeating certain words very insistently is about displacing those words, taking that further a little bit. And uh, you could approach that as a translator through being very insistent on working out a Fogel glossary and, and really just... Um, you know, infusing it through, uh, or as I chose to do in this case, just trying to displace the word and displace the word and displace the word and, and really show that, you know, there's many meanings of Shund and there's many different contexts that she's commenting on. And I hope that the translation accomplishes that. That being said, there might be a very different translation of this poem, um, which perhaps insists on, you know, inscribing um, a single meaning. There are a lot of dimensions to that. And every, every translation is an interpretation and it's, it's uh, uh, we need, we need more of them. We need more of them. There, there are more translations of a uh, of Fogel to be found in journals. Maybe we can include some of them in the bibliography for the, for the program um, on, uh, on the Polish cultural institutes uh, main page. Um did you have something to, to add, Carolina? I was just thinking, you know, that, for example, I mean, Paris was very important place for her. Um, it's very interesting because she thinks New York was the center of the modernist world. But when she's translating, for example, Anna Margolin, an important New York Yiddish poet, she's seeing, you know, boulevard boulevards uh, where she's you know, writing about alleys in New York. So she's, you know, for her really visually, it's Paris who, that is like this, that offers, uh, you know, like a, an exemplary representation of the metropolis. And she calls, I mean, so Paris is full of Schund and she writes this Schund Ballade Paris. Paris. It shows us again uh, what Anastasia mentioned, that there are so many different meanings of Schund and that she's actually trying to deconstruct uh, this uh, notion through somehow reconstructing the kitsch. I mean, because we mentioned Tandetta, we mentioned uh, uh, Schund, but kitsch that many you know uh, modernist thinkers and artists operated with. It's it's another word that could be used in this context. We can end with one of her later prose works, um, which she wrote in in both Polish and. Uh, um, and in Yiddish um, from uh, Akacje Kvitno. Uh, and uh, since you've, uh, let's see, I have this here, uh, you know, done this beautiful edition uh, published by Austeria, which is publishes really, you know, wonderful, you know, beautiful books um, of uh, Akacje Kvitno. Uh, would, would you like to read maybe uh, um, uh, Flower Shops with Azaleas? Maybe, maybe just read like the first couple of paragraphs and then, uh, maybe Anastasia could read it in, uh, in, uh, in her English translation. Kwieciarnia zaliowa. W mieście błękitnej szarości pięciu milionów nóg są także sklepy z ogromnymi, płaskimi, kulistymi kwiatami. Azalie z kwieciarni na bulwach Montparnasse w Paryżu są doskonałe. Są koloru łososia i koloru pomarańczy i prezentują w stu niuansach kolor marynowanej, wytrawnej ryby łososiowej i kolor kulistego owocu pomarańczy. 
Azalie z bulwaru Montparnasse nie potrzebują już woni przeciągłych i kontemplatywnych, jak zwykłe kwiaty. One mogą już być jak z blachy atłasowej, bezwonnej blachy. Całą duszę włożyły w kolor, niezrozumiały i pełen smutnych doświadczeń, jak metal blachy. Rzecz dzieje się latem 1933, równocześnie z opisanymi zdarzeniami. Przez szumiący bulwar Montparnasse przechodzi nagle smutek ogromny, blaszane morze melancholii. Przedostaje się, nie wiadomo którędy, do sklepu azaliowego. Jest dzień szary i słodki, jeden z całej serii. Ludzie szukają twardych przedmiotów dla rąk albo ścian szarych i ścian kolorowych plakatów. Są w poszukiwaniu zdarzeń wyraźnych i jednoznacznych, a to, co dzieje się ze sklepem azeliowym, jest w gruncie rzeczy bardzo podobne do sprawy dawno znanej i całkiej pospolitej. Ale przez dłuższy czas nie można przypomnieć sobie, skąd zna się ten ciężar tępy i bezfarbny. Aż nagle wie się, że przychodzi zawsze, ilekroć rzecz jakaś naszego życia dobiegła końca. I nic więcej z nią się stać nie może. Przed tym sklepem z azaliami, które są jak z melancholijnej i twardej równocześnie blachy wykonane i jak gdyby wypróbowały już wszystkie zapachy możliwe, staje się nagle życie jak sztreka długa i szara, gdzie wszystko jest już załatwione i minęło wszystko, co przyjść miało. I nagle nie do wytrzymania stają się rzeczy doskonałe i słodkie spotkania i wytworne azalie pomarańczowe. I nagle pragnie się Bezsensownie, żeby były pokoje jakieś nieforemne, pokoje za wielkie, sprzętami, ludźmi zawalone i losy przegrane i miłości nieudane, nieszczęśliwe miłości. Anastasia, would you like to read your uh, translation? Flower shops for the Zalias. In the city of blue grayness and five million legs, there are also shops with huge, flat, spherical flowers. Azaleas and the flower shop on the boulevard Montparnasse in Paris are perfect. Their color is like that of salmon or oranges. In fact, they reflect a hundred shades of noble smoked locks or round oranges. Azaleas from the boulevard Montparnasse in Paris no longer need the drawn out and contemplative fragrances of the ordinary flowers. They could be made of satin, odorless, Grass. They have poured their whole soul into the color, which is incomprehensible and full of sad experiences like brass itself. This event takes place in the summer of 1933, at the same time as the other events described here. A great sadness suddenly passes through the bustling boulevard Montparnasse, a brass sea of melancholy. It seeps, no one knows how, from the shops filled with azaleas. The day is gray and sweet, one in a series of gray days. People search for hard objects to hold in their hands. They search for gray walls and the walls of dazzling billboards for distinct and unambiguous events. And this thing which is taking place here at the azalea shop, in fact, completely resembles something known for a long time, a usual thing, but for a long time, what could not remember where this dull and colorless burden had come from. Until suddenly, one knows that what is happening now on the boulevard Montparnasse always happens when a thing is settled and when nothing can be done about it anymore. In front of the shop were the melancholy and yet hard brass azaleas that have no fragrance as if they had tried on all possible fragrances, life suddenly becomes like a long gray stretch where everything is already settled and everything that was supposed to happen has already passed. And suddenly, perfect things and sweet encounters and elegant azaleas, an elegant orange azaleas become unbearable. And suddenly one desires houses formless and too large, filled with things and people. One desires missed opportunities and failed romances and unhappy loves. The weed of longing grows and spreads the longing for things full of coarse solitude 
and for the bleary burdock cleaves up unrest. And like the grotesque tagline of a pulp novel, the following sentences form, among perfect things, there is no longer a place for life. This is where abandonment and dull sadness come from, which goes hand in hand with every nice thing. That's why people need a bit of raw disorder and coarse abandonment in life in general. And who would have thought that these far-reaching conclusions would have stemmed from unimportant azaleas as if made of sad grass? Yet, that's how life works. The most meaningless things remind us of the most important things in life. That uh, brings together the uh, sort of the the cubist aesthetics of you know flattened objects of flat fields of color, um, Schunt, uh certainly uh, melancholia, um, all in one uh, one text. That the idea of uh, there being meaning in Tandetta, meaning in Schunt, meaning in uh, kitsch uh, and and uh, and so forth it's one of the there's a lot of commentary on this uh, on this uh, work on this passage what I would also mention is that um, she does a lot in in this very short passage if you really um, learn about her uh, sort of the philosophical underpinnings of what she's trying to do here and Fogel is really unique. In, in trying to marry the philosophy and the praxis, uh, reading the first sentence, in the city of blue grayness and five million legs, there are also shops with huge flat spherical flowers. So we see juxtaposition of dynamism and stillness. City of blue grayness and five million legs seems to accelerate us, uh, to thrust us, into this event that's happening before our eyes and there is immediate focus on you know still life of of those um flat flowers in 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 a in a flower shop um so it's in a way filmic or photographic and she does engage with a variety of media that came to the fore in this in this period um there is also mention of, you know, this event. So the event of flower shops with azaleas, uh, we usually tend to think of events as, you know, um, anthropocentric uh, types of events, huge upheavals, uh, wars, pandemics. Um, and she seems to insist that there is an event of, you know, this this thing, this this object, obviously, uh, there's um, an affect aspect to to this. We we talked a little bit about the melancholy here, and you know the event is really working on the limit between the thing and the human that we also mentioned uh, in the beginning is part of Fogel's uh, philosophical pro program, and also something that um, other intellectuals like the Tkatsi about it's a very tense moment in europe in 1933 right i mean the nazis are coming to power in germany um and uh you know it's something that like you know, for instance Gombrowicz writes about uh, uh in his last interview a kind of testament he talks about uh europe being in this very you know kind of unstable state people throwing themselves into uh into odd states experimenting with narcotics and things like that um and uh you know maybe this is another expression of that 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 tension going on of course i mean her writings both in mannequin and um, the, in um Akatsu and um, are very political and they're an answer um, and they offer her own answer to multiple crises I mean it's uh, the economic crisis the social crisis also in Poland and the political uh, crisis and the date here she, she uses dates very intentionally and uh, and it's also her method I mean what uh, Anastasia mentioned I mean what is an event and how we should think about what's happening around us I mean she the the method of montage helps her you know uh 
think differently of how we can represent those crises, the next uh, uh, mon I mean, uh, montage that follows this uh, this piece is about soldiers marching. And in her theory of montage, she explained uh, how she's combining the two, actually. And it was very important for her to have both uh, those texts read together. Uh, interestingly, she was very angry at her editors who didn't understand her idea and her aesthetics. And they would publish one montage separately and then the another one in another issue, which really didn't help her readers uh, understand what she was doing. Um, so in but we see more and more politics entering in this collage uh, style her own writing so while in the first uh, poetry book this was really about geometry then this melancholic aspect is more and more visible then it's the politics and the economy the world crisis uh, and uh, she's prepared a whole series about the 20th century she never finished it but we see from her correspondence that she was preparing a book of essays. And also, I think what we see in Manekin and our new poetry books that she ne was never able to uh, publish, but maybe they were there. They were just destroyed uh, during the war or even worse after the war. Um, what I think is also fascinating about this particular uh, fragment is how we see how her own texts are interconnected. They're really uh, uh, a lot of um, and ready-made in her own writing. She's inserting sentences, whole sentences and images uh, from other texts into this, uh, into this text. And they're really uh, intertextual, intertextually related to her poems, to her art criticism and to her own private correspondence. We see that this is not a mere experiment, like, you know, in trying to write avant-garde prose, that this is a, a very consistent uh, life philosophical uh, project, and that there is actually also this biographical experience behind it. And she was insisting on, uh, on this mm, experiential aspect of her own writing. She was accused of being, you know, like so cold and so uh, stiff. And this was the method. But behind that is really uh, not only, you know, the, the, the life matter, but it's her own biographical signature. And I, for example, I followed her through Paris uh, with her own writings. I mean, I know where, you know, the, 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 the flower shop was, where the cafe she is. I mean, they are there, so you can follow Paris with, with her, but also follow what she saw in Paris. That's fascinating. That's what Anastasia mentioned. I mean, the first frame, we see those, you know, legs marching. I mean, this is one of the favorite frames of the avant-garde photographers and, and films and we see actually and, and in these uh, prose uh, pieces we see really film frames translated and inserted into her own writing so we could follow you know what she was seeing in different cinemas while in Paris or well in in uh, in Lviv uh, or in Berlin I mean uh, sometimes it's very explicit but sometimes it's not so explicit but uh, if you understand her method you, you can really also uh, have another, I mean, they really uh, are open to another type of of reading. And I find it uh, uh, very uh, fascinating here. And also, I mean, what you see in the Polish language, I mean, she, how she's really sometimes using uh, unusual words yeah, uh, or Galician words. This is something that is lost to the Polish language today, like that she's using streka, for example, uh, and bezfarbny. Uh, um, that, that that are specific to her own idiom or to the Galician uh, Polish uh, she's uh, uh, she's speaking. So this is uh, something that is really the 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 language that she's constructing here, the Polish language. I mean, this is simply supposed to to shake you off your your uh, you know like uh, typical. Uh, um, ways of reading and what you expect uh, to read. And that's what she does uh, in the language. I, th I think the, the translation achieves the same thing. I mean, it's not what you think you would uh, read about a, a Parisian boulevard. And she also engages with different notions of time. 
as you mentioned, the historical time, the teleological time, there's obviously events happening in 1933 in Europe, a very tense moment, as we mentioned. There is also, you know, this notion of calendric time, which we covered previously. Um, you can think about, you know, Jewish history, European history, also Jewish history, right? Different different notions of time. And of course, Schultz um, could come up, you know, with his notions about messianic time. So she she plays with different notions of time, and she also plays with different notions of discourse, where with Schultz and, you know, perhaps other male writers, you might have their um, uneasy relationship with the Talmudic regime and, you know, engagement uh, with the notion of commentary, with the notion of discourse. There is also her engagement, you know, in what Carolina mentioned, um, her inserting self-citation throughout um, both her prose oeuvre and uh, her poetry is also playing, you know, with this notion of commentary, with this notion of of discourse and, and trying to disentangle all of that. Anastasia, you told us a little about your uh, vocal uh, bio, uh, biography project uh, at the beginning. Carolina, do, would you like to do you have any what, what's next? What's next on your agenda for for vocal? Yeah. So I started with vocal as a very young person, and it's really great to see so many uh, scholars. And Anastasia is really a leading scholar here uh, and engage with Fogel. So I am coming back to my old really uh, work um, um, and I'm publishing a new revised edition of something that was at that time, which was almost 20 years ago, uh, the first uh, presentation of Fogel as a as a writer and not as a muse of different modernist uh, writers coming back with new materials, uh, archival materials, but also new works. And I mean, some texts that I think are remain unknown and that that's something that is exciting for me. We have, uh, you know, usually some uh, students watching our program um, thinking about uh, research and graduate study um, in uh, in uh, Polish literature and related fields. Um, so, uh, Carolina, could you, could you say a few words about uh, about studying Yiddish in Poland, uh, the summer program in Warsaw, the Jewish studies program in, in Wrocław, where you teach, and uh, and if you have any plans to be in the United States again uh, anytime soon? Poland is a place in Europe to study Yiddish, actually. So I think it's one of the most uh, exciting centers right now of Yiddish, contemporary Yiddish scholarship in, in Europe. Uh, you can come to Warsaw and participate in the intensive summer program in Yiddish language and uh, culture. That's one uh, option. But you can also enroll for the full program, a May program, for example, in East European uh, Jewish studies offered by uh, the University of Wrocław. Uh, this is a program offered in English, actually. And uh, it has three pillars, one of which is actually Yiddish, Yiddish literature, modern Yiddish culture, and women's writing. So uh, so if you're interested uh, in writers uh, such as Fogel, and I mean, Fogel is one and only, but there are other women writers uh, in Yiddish, important women writers whom uh, actually, uh, Fogel engaged with like Kadia Mordowski, uh, Rochel Korn, and uh, others. Um, you can come to Wrocław and uh, study uh, Yiddish uh, there, and have access also to uh, to this. The, the program's focus is Eastern European context, which, as I think we also shown with Fogel, she's a very international intellectual, really placing herself in, at the center of many different uh, international discussions. But at the same time. The Eastern European uh, context, the Polish, the Ukrainian, the German, the Austrian context are, um, well, Central Eastern European then, uh, are crucial uh, for really unpacking what she's offering us as a writer and intellectual. Thanks so much to both of you for uh, joining us on Encounters with Polish Literature. And I hope we can uh, do it again sometime and do more, um, you know, more episodes on uh Yiddish writers uh, in Poland and writing about Poland. Uh, it's uh, well, maybe uh, you know, 
maybe that's a that's that's a whole other other episode to talk about uh, uh, about where Yiddish fits in in, um, in the context of Polish literature. So we'll save that for uh, then. So thank you for joining me. Thank you. Thank you, David and Carolina. It's been a pleasure. Special new stuff coming up. Please subscribe and click the bell to receive notifications about new videos from the Polish Cultural Institute New York. Go to the Polish Cultural Institute's website linked in the description below to see a full schedule of upcoming episodes. Stay tuned for the credits for some recommendations about how you can support aid for Ukraine and for Ukrainians fleeing the war in their country. I'd like to thank all the people who helped make this series possible. The Polish Cultural Institute New York sponsors our program. Bartek Rymisko, Head of Humanities and Literature at the Polish Cultural Institute New York, suggested this series and is our executive producer. My fellow producer, Natalia Iudin, handles all the video editing, technical and aesthetic aspects of this production, including those wonderful new titles. Claudia Ofwana Draber, Head of Communications at the Polish Cultural Institute New York, keeps us all informed about upcoming episodes of Encounters with Polish Literature. And our fantastic new music is by Radek Przedpilski. Thank you all for listening and reading along with us. Let's meet again in a month when Stanley Bill from Cambridge University will join me to discuss the work of Nobel Prize winning novelist Henrik Sienkiewicz. See you then. Tak szare, tak płaskie są domy ludzi i pojazdy.